So, you know, we do this thing every Sunday where we read a big chunk of the Bible. Not all churches do this. You know this, right? Not all churches read this much. A lot of them do. But we read the Holy Scriptures every Sunday because these, we believe these are words that are inspired by God, that are breathed out by Him. And through these words, He breathes His life into us to make us whole and strong. So let me invite you to open the ears of your heart, to listen with your whole being, so that in receiving His word, you will receive Him afresh, and He will continue to transform you to be holy as He is holy. Our reader this morning is Paul the Heart, but before we actually hear what the reading that Paul will give, let's ask for God's help, that His Spirit will, will um, open His word to us. Let's pray. O oh, gracious, gracious God, as we turn now to your word given for us, may your spirit rest upon us. Help us to be steadfast in our hearing. Help us to be faithful in our speaking. Help us to be firm in our believing and then righteous in our living. For Jesus is Lord. Amen. Let us listen to the word of the Lord together. We begin from a reading from the prophet Isaiah. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told from you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its habitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? What that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, no one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right hand is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, And young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there may be many so-called gods in heaven or earth, as indeed there are many, quote, gods and many, quote, lords, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled." Food will not commend us to God. 
We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better if we do so. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother from whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. And from the Gospel of Mark, <clears throat> chapter 1. And when they came into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed. So they asked questions among themselves. What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew and James, with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her. And she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought him to all who were sick and oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases. And he cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early the next morn, morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him. They said, everyone's looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. That was tremendous. Uh, show of hands, how many of you have read or saw the movies of The Lord of the Rings? Raise your hand. Okay, that's a good chunk. If, if you're not in that crowd, just bear with me. It, we'll try to make it make sense to you anyways. But for those of you that are familiar with the story, you may recall the moment in The Return of the King, the third, the third chunk, right? After the battle of the Pelennor Field, before the walls of Minas Tirith, when Eowyn, the shield maiden of the Rohirrim, I know I'm losing some of you already, uh, the shield maiden of the Rohirrim and Faramir, the mighty captain of Gondor, lay stricken by the black shadow, and no healing art could penetrate the fevered darkness that gripped them in ice and shade. And then a wise woman named Eorath remembered that it is said in the old lore, the hands of the king are the hands of a healer. And so, Aragorn, the once exiled king, now returned to his realm, came to them, and by his kingly power, he drew them up out of their darkness and brought healing to both their hearts and to their bodies. It's a beautiful story. If you haven't read it, do it. If you can't do that, get the movies. It's great. Now this week's gospel passage is all about our king and how his hands are the hands of a healer. Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, our long-awaited king. And I'm here today to tell you, standing before you, to say that Jesus has come to save you and Jesus has come to heal you. I don't know who needs to hear that, but that's what I felt I really needed to say, that just lay it right out there. Jesus has come to save you, 
and Jesus has come to heal you. Now let's talk about what that means. Right? I want to stress that because this gospel story that we heard today about some events that happened so, so long ago, it suggests to us, if you take it all of a piece, not just this one little chunk, but the whole thing, it suggests to us that Jesus is present among us today, liberating us and healing us, just as he did for those people so long ago. Why is that story in there? Why is that story in there? We don't know any of those people. Why does that matter to us? It's an example. Jesus did that for them, and it suggests he does this for us. Do you see that? Now, how can this be? <laughs> right? We all know that people still suffer from all kinds of sickness, spiritual, emotional trauma, and often in spite of many, many prayers. How can I say Jesus heals, right? Is there, is there healing and deliverance for today, or is that only for some far-off day? Now, some of you may be getting a little worried that I'm going all health and wealth, uh, you know, claim it, claim it, gospel. That's not where I'm headed at all. Stick with me. <laughs> I, I think there is healing and deliverance today. But as is so often the case with the story of the Bible, the way it works out in our real lives may not be quite what we expect for a variety of reasons. So to grasp the lesson, I think, we, we need to do is, one of the things we need to do is expand our understanding of healing and liberation. So when I say God saves you, what I don't mean Jesus saves you is that he's giving us the ticket to heaven, although that's part of the deal. What I'm saying is he liberates us from what is oppressing us. Right? So there's a story of Jesus liberating this man with an unclean spirit. We're not going to talk a lot about what unclean spirit means, blah, 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 right? But what I want to do is make sure that you understand, that I understand, that I think, those spirits are real spirits. They're real, they're real entities. They're, they're not just psychological problems. They're not mental illness, right? Or it's not as simple as that, let's put it that way. But I think if the scripture says this was an unclean spirit, it was an unclean spirit, right? It was a real a real thing. And so we see Jesus in his ministry now confronting two types of conditions. Physical infirmity, I use the word infirmity just to cover the whole gamut of everything that goes wrong with our bodies, and spiritual oppression. And I'm using that in the sense of the whole gamut from actual oppression by living spirits, you know, who bring, living spirits who bring death, living is not the right word, but uh, as well as mental illness and psycho-emotional trauma and all that kind of, that whole gamut, right? Everything, spiritual oppression. And this is, it's hard for us, like I had to really think about this. It's hard for us, I think, because we are 21st century Americans, we tend to think of these kinds of problems through a materialist or a behaviorist framework, right? Um, so that sickness, we tend to think of sickness, sickness has physical causes. Right? There's a bacteria, or a virus, or a wound, or, or behaviors that foster ill health over time, right? And we think, and we think that's the end of the story. And I, I think, no, there's actually more to it than that. And we think that spiritual oppression, right, these uh, mental and emotional issues can be genetic predisposition, or chemical imbalance, or events in our lives that assault and damage our emotions. And those things are real, just like bacteria and viruses are real. Um, they're, they're causes of the, um, of the conditions in question. And this kind of understanding that we have these days is very helpful in treating these, these conditions, aren't they? Right? I'm so thankful that if something goes wrong, I can go to a physician who can prescribe a treatment or do something to help me get, over, right, get past that. I think of you, some of you remember when my daughter Emma broke her ankle and spent eight days down at Boston Children's Hospital. If it wasn't for the techniques of medicine today, I think she would be a cripple after that. It was that bad. Um, but there's this deeper question. So those are, those are what you might call immediate causes, but there are deeper causes to why, 
why this stuff happens anyways, right? Why do, why do people get sick? Why do people experience spiritual oppression? And I think the Bible suggests there is a much deeper cause. And I think we're given these stories to help us to understand this. The story of the Bible suggests that we dwell under the dominion of the powers of sin and death. We dwell under the dominion of the powers of sin and death. And again, as I mentioned before, we tend to think of sin primarily as some kind of guilt-inducing event. Some produce more guilt than others. (laughs) Something we do wrong that we shouldn't do. But if we read carefully what Jesus said and did and look at what he did and we read what the apostles wrote when they wrote about sin, we see that they speak and act as if sin is a spiritual force at work in the world. And here's where I think it comes from. I think you know the story. Our first parents, they were faced with this choice. And the choice was not about which fruit are we going to have for lunch. Right? The choice was between life and death. The fruit right, that we talked about, that, and, you know, those are just symbols. Not just symbols. They're symbols of life and death. Choose life, which means to love God fully and truly and do his will and love those made in God's image. That is, that is to choose life. Or choose death, which is the way of self-choosing which is giving primacy to our own desires and our selfish urges, judging good and bad for ourselves without referencing God's intentions or God's will. I'm going to decide for myself, I want to do this because I want to do it. I don't know. I've said that a lot of times. Anybody else? Don't raise your hand. (laughs) We've already confessed, right? And you know the story. Our first parents, they chose the way of death. They didn't think it was the way of death. They were deceived into thinking that that path that they then devised for themselves, oh, that's a good fruit. We're going to go ahead and eat that. We're going to choose that path. They were deceived into thinking that would make them like God. And so they unwittingly, in doing that, gave creation over to the dominion of death. And do we not see the influence of death everywhere in everything every day. We'll talk about that in a a little bit more. Because death is not merely this event when the biological machine we call a body ceases to operate. It's more than that. Again, the Bible presents death as an elemental force controlling and corrupting every part of creation. And when we understand death in this way, We see that physical infirmity is the power of death at work in our bodies. Do you see that? It's not just a virus. It's not just a wound. It's the power of death at work in us. Pulling us, and and spiritual oppression is the power of death at work in our souls. Pulling us away from the the order and the goodness that's in the life of God and pulling us toward confusion and scarcity and anxiety and chaos instead of the fullness of life in God. Does that make sense? So the deepest root of the problem, of all the problems, is not physical, it's not chemical, it's not mechanical, it's not economical, it's not political, it's not social, it's not emotional or psychological. Those are real problems, but those aren't the root of the problem those are fruit. Those are, those are the manifestation of the spiritual problem. By spiritual problem, here's what I mean. It means they emerge from our broken relationship with God. They emerge from our broken relationship with God. And because our relationship with God is broken, it cuts us off from his life. So another way to look at that I I talk about the dominion of death. So we're really talking about kingdoms. So a couple weeks ago, we talked about the Jesus sermon, right? The kingdom of God is at hand, right? So we're talking about kingdoms, 
Because the kingdom of God is the opposite of the kingdom of death. Right? So, in a podcast recently, um, I listen to podcasts a lot, I was reminded about how Dallas Willard, I don't know if any of you know that name, he wrote a most excellent book I can recommend called uh, The Divine Conspiracy. It's a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. If you're looking for some great devotional reading, The Divine Conspiracy, Dallas Willard. Dallas Willard talked about one of the difficulties we face when we discuss the kingdom of God, which is what the Sermon on the Mount is all about, is Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But we look around us and we go, is it? Is it though? Is it really? Because things clearly are not as they should be. Can we agree on that? Things are not as they should be. So if, as, as we say, the kingdom of God is here and now, we then also have to say, but it is also not here yet. It is not fully here. So the question is, well, how much here is it? <laughs> or how much here isn't it? Right? That's kind of the question. So to think about that, let's talk about what's a kingdom. Bear with me, I know we're kind of going. I had two weeks to think about this and then a couple days to kind of condense it, so I'm doing the best I can. But what is a kingdom? Think of a kingdom this way. A kingdom is those aspects of the world around you, those people or those things over which you have some degree of control. Right? We talked about it a couple weeks ago as your garden spot. This area of influence is our kingdom over which we exercise the dominion that God made us to exercise. And so the problem, as Willard puts it, is there are other kingdoms than God's that are still present on earth. You follow? The world is full of kingdoms. And the thing is, a lot of these other kingdoms are not in alignment with God's kingdom. They're not in submission to God's kingdom. And this is the human condition. That persons other than God, such as you or or me, right, we're still allowed to have a say that's contrary to God's will. And that's that's, that's the problem. And all of this, it not only bends our hearts away from God, it bends all of creation, because we were set up, we were created to rule over creation, have dominion. So when we have bad dominion, it results in what? Bad creation. Right? Not, not bad, but bent. Not working right, right? So this is why we see the social, and the personal, and the natural dysfunction we experience every day. This is the dominion of death at work in us and around us. It's not just the breakdown of our bodies, the trauma of our spirits, the pollution of air and water, the disintegration of political and social order. It's all of that. But all of that arises from our failure to fully love God and others. You see? And this is just as much the case 2,000 years ago as it is today. It looked a little different back then, but it's the same problem. And so into this rather hopeless situation enters King Jesus. And he speaks a word and people are freed from their spiritual oppression. No fancy gyrations, no magic spells. He just says, get out. And with a touch, he heals the diseases and makes the damaged whole again. No medicines, no complicated treatments. He just touches them. And when he does that, he's not merely giving a treatment or alleviating pain. He is demonstrating something for us. That's why the story is recorded there. He's demonstrating his absolute an unassailable authority over the power of death itself. This is why this story is included in the season of Epiphany. Epiphany is just another word for, let me show you who I really am. Let's take a look at who Jesus really is. Let's take a look at how what he said and what he reveals him to be, the Son of God, the Messiah, come to save and liberate us.
That's why the story's in this, in this season. He is demonstrating his absolute and unassailable authority over the power of death, the force of death at work in the world. And how can he do this? He can do it because he is truly God who took humanity upon himself and became the only truly, fully human one as humans were intended to be. This is why Paul calls him the new Adam. And he never failed to love God completely. He always succeeded in loving other people entirely. And yet, even having never sinned, he took responsibility for the failure of all humanity upon himself. Having lived wholeheartedly for others, he died willingly for our sin. And then he was raised from the dead because he has all the authority, even over death. He was raised from the dead and he offers us the gift of his life covering up for our failure. The apostles said he committed no sin, yet he carried our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to our sins and live to do what is right. So listen, what does that mean? He carried our sins in his body. Well, we're carrying our sins in our bodies. But he took our sin into his body. You see? So we can live to do what is right. So when we give our loyalty to Jesus for the first time or the fifth time or the 500th time, because I don't know about you, but I'm constantly making course corrections along those lines. Oh, I think I'm getting a little off. I should get back on, right? When we give our loyalty to Jesus and place our faith in him and our trust in him and follow in his path in imitation of his life, seeking to love God as Jesus loved God, seeking to love others as he loved others, the promise is that we will also find healing and liberation that gives us peace even in the midst of pain and that grants us grace even in our struggles. We live in God's kingdom. Yeah? We live in God's kingdom as we learn to trust Jesus and his way. And in practical terms, that can look like a lot of different things. It looks like giving over pride and power, even small power, even little pride, for humility and weakness. It means letting go of what benefits us for the sake of promoting what is good for others. You know, I, I say these things in generalized terms because I don't know where you are in your life. I don't know what's happening in your life. It, means relinquish, it can mean relinquishing our anger and frustration over how we really want things to be to embrace the gifts God has placed within our reach. Even, even though we can only reach, you know, we can't reach beyond our suffering and our pain and our limitation. Even those who Jesus healed in those days, they eventually got sick again and died. But I... But when I thought of that, I thought of what it was like when I had the privilege to be with the George family in the hours before Priscilla's death. And some of you here have ministered to the dying, and you understand what that moment can be like. Well, I'll tell you what it was like in that hospital room on that night with those people. The kingdom of God was very near. Transforming Priscilla's impending death, it was a surety. Transforming Priscilla's impending death from a fearful power into a beautiful portal. Opening up to a more complete and certain and ultimate healing. A more glorious consolation. An eternal day of gladness and light and life. It was there. It was very close. 
And this was so, here's the important thing to remember, this didn't just happen. It didn't just happen that day. It happened because for decades, I don't know if Priscilla would have put it this way, but for decades, Priscilla prayed, thy kingdom come. And she prayed it not so that his kingdom would come into existence. She knew his kingdom was here. But she prayed that his kingdom would take over more and more and more and more of the personal and social and political order around her, including her own heart. I see nodding heads. Those of you who knew her even better than I attest to that. Right? And in so praying, she invoked God's kingdom. You know what invoke means? She called down God's kingdom over decades. And not just her, Lou and her family, right? They were all there. She invoked God's kingdom, and in faith, she sought to act it out, bringing his kingdom into a reality of healing and freedom in the real world of her daily existence. So when I think of what it was like for these people whom Jesus healed, to eventually come to their death, I pray that many of them anchored back to that and were like, yes, the kingdom of God is here. He's already touched me. Let's finish it, right? Jesus, finish it. I pray that we might all, every single one of us, individually and collectively, be experiencing God's kingdom right now in just this way. Christ came to save you. Christ came to heal you. And whether Christ grants a measure of healing to you now and a degree of freedom from trauma today, that's good. Praise God if he does that. Because he does that. He does do it. We've been, you, you, none of us are new with this game here. We've seen it happen, have we not? Right? He does that. And sometimes we must wait. We must wait for that ultimate healing and liberation that shall come when he appears again in glory. But be sure of this. By dying and rising, Christ has conquered death forever for you and for me. He came to heal you and to save you. So let's together be invoking his kingdom, walking more deeply into God's territory so that we may walk filled with his life into a place where there's no place for death. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.